on day five. I can't even see Apollo's lyre from here. We speed. That means that Eric's entrance is probably around here somewhere. Here we have a grand staircase. This, of course, is box five, the most famous box in the entire opera, as seen by this sign. Yes, there is a pillar that you can knock on. It sounds hollow. Yes, you can sit in it while technically not being seen by anyone else. Shh, we're in here secretly. Nobody's supposed to know it. Okay, so guys, I just managed to sneak past the guards and I found this trap door in the stairwell. I don't know where this is gonna go, but I'm not passing up this chance. Okay, I have to be really quiet because nobody's supposed to know I'm here. I'm not gonna lie, I'm just a little bit scared right now. <laughs> I think I just heard a noise behind me. down and I had the last five floors soundproofed ever since One Direction were playing at the opera last month. You have come to me in my loneliness to bring me beauty and music. Tremble at the sight of my mask, child, for I am Eric, Phantom of the Opera. Wait, 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 wait. I know that voice. Uh, look, as much as I want to be helpless in the face of Eric and all, you're not Eric, are you? Uh, uh, I, I don't know what you mean, my child. Of course I am. I have a mask and gloves and a little coffin bed and everything. How much more eric -y do you want? Wait, you're the Phantom Reviewer, aren't you? I used to watch your videos all the time! So is this what you're doing with your time now? Oh, okay, you got me. It's the perfect hideaway, isn't it? Apt, even. I get to hide away from the world while occasionally preying on the fangirls who are foolish enough to go exploring the depths of the catacombs. You're the fifth girl I've captured this month. Ah, oh, yes, all those intrepid fangirls trying to find the real phantom. And that's what I give them. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of creepy. Oh, yeah, right. So, let me get this right. When your beloved Eric of the novel gets Christine into his bachelor pad by pretending to be her dead father, that's romantic. But when I pretend to be Eric to get me some fangirl tale, then suddenly it's creepy. <sighs> Anyway, no matter. You can keep me company for the next few months. I was just about to get started on a marathon viewing of all 30 episodes of the Phantom Lover TV series from Japan, and I need someone to hold my hand. Uh, yeah, that sounds fun and everything, but I can do you one better. You like the Tom Alonzo version, don't you? Yeah, it's okay. I have the soundtrack album. It, it's not bad. Well, I just happen to be the biggest Tom Alonzo fan ever, and I have something that you don't. Premiere on video? <sighs> okay, and you just happen to have it on you, I suppose? Uh, no, it's locked away in a secret folder online, but I'll tell you how to find it if you just let me go! Ooh, new fun to me, goodness. Oh, goody, goody, goody. <laughs> okay, you've got yourself a deal, Missy. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at the uh, Tom Alonzo version. Now, I've already reviewed the soundtrack album to this on my More Phantom Musicals podcast. Uh, you can find it on my YouTube channel, so if you haven't already listened to that, don't be lazy, check it out. But uh, if you are lazy, yeah, basically, I liked it. It's a good score with a few really nice songs in it. It's not as memorable as the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, but it's about the same standard of the Eston and Copic musical, which is still a high standard. I believe the video of this is the world premiere, which I think was in 1992, and it was performed at Toby's Dinner Theatre in Columbia, Maryland. It's one of those places where, you know, as you'd expect, you, you have dinner and you see a show. Toby's Dinner Theatre is run by Toby Orenstein, and it's actually two different places in Maryland. It's in Columbia, where the 1992 premiere was, and there was also one in Baltimore, where I saw the revival in 2008. I think they perform a mixture of established musicals, along with a few of their own special written shows and this was one of them and it's uh, mainly performed in the round which can be a bit disconcerting in the dramatic moments when you can see the audience sort of just sat around the actors filling their faces and this is a sort of a weird video it feels a bit like a bootleg with some really bad camera work but 
it looks kind of professionally edited, although not always. I can only assume the producers got a few mates together to film it, so they had the premiere on record. Uh, occasionally the sound is a little bit unclear, particularly when there's a lot of people singing at once. Uh, the Phantom is performed by Braxton Peters, who is amazing. <laughs> Look at that! Wig! 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 Yeah. Gotta stop you there. That's not a wig. What? That's Braxton Peters' real hair. You're joking. You've got to provide me with photographic proof of that, I think, Missy. You want proof? Okay. Here's a photo. Huh. Okay. Mind officially blown. So the show starts out with a court investigation into the events leading up to Christine's disappearance. Now, this whole courtroom thing is used as an exposition device. It's an effective way of summarising some of the boring stuff out of the book that would take way too long to go into. The transitions in and out of courtroom are really quite nicely done. What happened, precisely? Well, I got into the dressing room and Monsieur Pelletier was attending to Mademoiselle Delay. I asked him, why is there anything I can do, sir? Yes, yes, see what's keeping the doctor and see if you can find any smelling salts. This is one of those other versions that has heavy influence from Faust. <laughs> Christine is a really good singer, authentically operatic, and it really shows here, not, not only her, but the whole chorus as well. The whole chorus have pretty amazing singers for such a small troupe. I've always been more into the Phantom than the opera. I, I really don't know much about opera, but I like bits from Faust. In particular, I like this bit. Agnes Purs Agnes Radiux Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Is an absolute knockout performance from the company. Really, really well done. In fact, all the principles are good. Ral has a good voice, very powerful, and he doesn't come across as foppish at all. Very heroic and likeable. And as I've said many times before in my previous audio version of this, Braxton Peters is superb, one of the most incredibly awesome phantom voices ever. Sorry, couldn't resist. In fact, there's a lot of awkward humour in this. It uh, mainly falls flat for me. thing I hate about this video is the editing is in a constant state of crossfade which confuses the hell out of me. Wait, did that corpse just move? He not only moves, he does this at the end. Okay. Maybe that was Alex Ventriloquist, who knows. There comes one of my favourite songs, I love this on the album, it's so jolly. <laughs> If this song wasn't ripped off under the sea from Little Mermaid, I'm going to put 12 live lobsters down my knickers. <laughs> so 
some of the scenes remind me of the manager scenes in the Andrew Lloyd Webber version. You know, we've got the humorous, witty dialogue and everything. I think he has definitely been influenced by that show, to be fair. You know, this came out in 1992, I think it was, and although it's much closer to LaRue, you can really see the influence of Andrew Lloyd Webber. In particular, they copy the half-mask idea and some of the costuming as well, particularly the costuming of Christine, particularly this outfit here. And damn... You could hide two dwarf rat catchers in that bustle. It's so big and round and I like big bustles and I cannot lie. In addition to the Andrew Lloyd Webber influences, I'd say it borrows a fair few elements from the Eston Copic play as well, particularly the scene where Christine and Carlotta have a sing-off. The script of the play follows the LaRue storyline very accurately indeed, and we have a Paris graveyard scene, which is always nice, and although the attack on Raoul is really lame and anticlimactic. Judo chop! I've already mentioned the fine voices of the principals, but also the acting is also pretty good. Christine and Raoul's relationship is quite realistic and not annoying at all. Sometimes they come across a little bit stagey, but hey, it's a stage play after all. Acting-wise, I think the comic relief tends to fall really flat with the overly excitable managers and Carl Otter, who's once again reduced to this Italian stereotypical comic relief. Still, she's big and juicy, just the way I like them. You know, I really love the general character of Carlotta in Phantom Adaptations, but it would be nice if she was given some dignity once in a while. I think the closest we ever got to that was the manipulative cow from the Claude Rains one. Now that was a really terrifying bint. But you'll either do as I say, or I'll charge both of them with trying to murder me. Do you understand that? Murder me! But all too often they just rely on her for some cheap laughs. Carlotta deserves better. We get to see Eric teaching Christine in a dressing room and oh come on, I, I can't take this phantom seriously with that monstrosity on his head. I mean, that's like a deformity all of its own. Should have put his mask on that hair. This phantom is pretty single-minded, he's obsessed with his music. In some ways this lesson reminds me of the scene from the Herbert Lom version. Some of the dialogue is also very similar. As you must sing, only for me. And when you sing, Christine, you will be singing only for me. When Christine leaves her lesson, we get one of the best songs in the show, The Love You Never Had, which is all about how it's better to have loved and to have lost than never to have loved at all. It speaks volumes about the character, and then again, Braxton Peters is terrific in performing this song, so I'm just going to shut up and let you enjoy some of it.
As with the Android Webber version, Act 1 closes with the fall of the chandelier, but it is somewhat anticlimactic as it sort of lands on the stage a bit and not in the audience. Now, if I were directing this show, I would make sure there was a dummy table with a little animatronic man on there who like, sits there all night eating fried chicken, belching and using his phone during the performance, and then at a key moment the chandelier comes down and impales him, Dario Argento style, sending gallons of fake blood bursting in all directions, and oh, how the crowd would cheer and clap, and why aren't I a freaking stage director instead of a loser on YouTube, which is what I am. Just like in the Claude Rains and Yeston Copic version, the Phantom uses the chandelier fall as a distraction to kidnap Christine. Christine? You must see only for me! Christine! Eternity. We fight it and we long for it all of our lives. Death! Death is so close. Hey, idiot! Turn your digital watch off. But I will be ready. Oh, and again! Seriously, are. man. Turn off your phones. Okay, you probably didn't have mobile phones in 1992, but turn your watches off. I'm too noisy, man. The unmasking is very LaRue faithful. He's playing the Othello music in this scene, I believe, which uh, I've not seen that in any of the other versions. And it's nice that the Phantom actually sings opera in this. Okay, in the novel, I think, wasn't it meant to be a piano, but an organ is so much cooler. And the deformity makeup is a half decent attempt to do a LaRue style face. Not bad for a low budget stage show at all. Oh, you would mourn me. You would mourn this. This is a fount of my genius, the flame that burns me. Shall I consume you? Oh, you think it another mask. You wish to rip it off this world and try. Try. I have tried. I will wear this mask of death and sleep like a corpse. Why? Why did you wish to look upon me? My own mother gave me my first mask, so she would not have to do so. You are done, Juan. Yes. Don Juan triumphant. Don Juan triumphant. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. Sorry for interrupting this touching and well acted scene. This leads us into another one of my favourite songs, a superbly handled flashback sequence called A Room Full of Shadows. We get grown-ass Eric and little Eric sharing the stage. I like that little Eric can play the violin and another nice nod to the book and, and wait, wait, wait. Is that actress playing his mother the same actress as Christine is, isn't it? Oh, for goodness sake. Is this yet another version where Christine reminds him of his mother? There isn't even the slightest hint of this in the book. If, if anything, it's the Phantom reminds Christine of her father. I really don't understand why writers keep putting this Oedipus complex subplot in. Okay, fine. Eric's mother is being played by Christine again, but I don't think it's an Oedipus complex this time. There are plenty of reasons why Eric might have replaced his mother with Christine in his imagination. For example, maybe they're the only women he'd e he's ever connected to in his life. You know, maybe that's it. Also, maybe the production company just wanted Christine to still be part of the scene somehow instead of her sitting around. One by one. I think it's always creepy to see versions with young Eric in his little blank baby mask. At a wardrobe? Child of a shadow game, of course. It was something in the dark, so she couldn't see me. Always in the dark, pretending I could be me. Only in the dark, and be free of one more. Really, me? 
I really enjoyed this scene. As far as I'm aware, this is a totally unique idea in Phantom adaptations to have Jung and Old Eric together looking at their life from different perspectives. It also features what I think is one of the most beautiful original lines in any Phantom adaptation. sequence always kind of makes me choke up a little. It's absolutely brilliant. <sighs> and then we're back to lame comic relief with the stupid managers, but you can't have everything. Sir, we immediately made our way on stage. Yes. Uh, there we sat on the encounter Sean Yee and the version. Yes. We didn't see Christine again for another two weeks. They do have a masquerade ball in this, but it's pretty weak looking in comparison with the spectacle of the Andrew Lloyd Webber version. Oh, every time I see scenes like this, the video editor in me wants to leap through the screen onto the other editor's computer and force the opacity of the clip up to 100% before choking him to death. This show looks a little bit cheap at times, particularly in the Apollo's Liar scene. The scenery is really lame and cardboard looking. Quite a few nice little details from LaRue, like uh, Eric's coffin bed. Also remember the minor subplot about Eric giving Christine a gold ring? That's in here. I don't recall that being in any other version, apart from perhaps a slight reference in the Robert Englund one. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. And neither were the audience by the look of it. Listen to them. They're cracking up over that. Don't you hate it when you're watching a show in the theatre and like you get to this really serious moment? Like maybe you're watching West Side Story or, or maybe even Love Never Dies, for instance. And then there's a gunshot and it's meant to be this really dramatic and heartbreaking moment. And but all you can hear for the next few minutes are people tittering away and saying, "Oh, that made me jump, Elsie. Oh, that was loud, wasn't it?" And it totally spoils the moment. You guys go to the theatre. Tell me I'm not the only one because that's happened to me a lot. Anyway, sidetracked. Uh, Christine gets abducted from the stage again. The backstage cast seem to take it very jolly, lily, jolly, jolly, lily. Oh, the Persian appears in this as well, which is always good. He doesn't have a hat though, which is bad. Oh, by the way, in the revival, the Persian was actually black. Yay for moderately accurate racial casting! So, as per the novel, uh, they end up in the torch chamber. <gasps> <laughs> oh. Free me! I'm dying before he goes back! 
We also have the scorpion and grasshopper scene, and that did make me wonder, why did the Eric of the novel do that anyway? Why didn't he just have, like, this one big button that says BOOM? Okay, I know he's barking mad, but I just thought that was a bit pointless. You know, quite a bit of trouble. Oops, butterfingers. What the hell was that, anyway? You drop a table. The final layer scene is largely as Lurie wrote it. It's well acted, but somewhat slow paced and wordy. No singing to liven it up. Then eventually we go back to the courtroom, who judges that the Phantom is just a legend, and then it just kind of ends with a little song called Haunted, which I find to be a boring, noisy, and anticlimactic ending. Eric doesn't even die as such, he just sort of runs off with little Eric or something, which I would thought would cause a major time paradox and destroy the space-time continuum, but what do I know about quantum physics? So what happened at the end of the revival is that uh, somehow the Persian and Raoul break out of the torture chamber and there's some sort of scuffle and Raoul ends up shooting Eric. Accidentally. I like the original ending better. It's much more LaRue and much more poignant. Although the other ending had uh, little Eric coming back as well. Overall, this show isn't bad. I would have loved to have seen this one live, actually. I think seeing the show so up close and intimate would have been great. This particular recording has a terrific principal cast of great singers who can also act pretty well, and I'd say there's maybe three pretty good songs in it, and the rest are just meh. But nothing in it is bad as such. I mean, nothing like the Ivan Jacobs one. Uh, yeah, I'd say it's the closest to LaRue that a musical has come so far, but it still has its own original ideas, and it's, yeah, it's entertaining. I like this one. If it ever gets revived, because it has been revived once before, I believe, check it out. Well, that was fun. So now we're done, right? I can leave? Wait, what are you doing? Is that a VHS tape? What Phantom movie could possibly be so bad that it wasn't released on DVD? Oh, I wish I was an Oscar Mayer wiener And then everyone would be a 